Welcome to the Ian Bowsfield Experience. I'm glad you're here. This series of podcasts are just things that come up in my mind when I'm thinking about playing, when I'm thinking about teaching, and general thoughts about music. There are some things here that I hope you'll find really useful. And don't forget, if you've got any comments or if there's anything you want to discuss further, go to ianbowsfield.com. Okay, so a question here from uh, Perry O'Brien. And I'm plowing straight into this one, the first answer. Um, It's a brilliant question and a very, very justifiable question, Perry, holding people like me to rights. So I listened to your feature on Spotify. I woke up this morning, took a new appreciation for the oxygen that fueled me, went to Carnegie Hall and told myself I should sound beautiful. I sang the upcoming passage in my head just the way I wanted it to sound, then split the horn solo in spirity into 1,300 pieces all over the roof. All over the roof, sorry. (laughs) Admittedly, I've exaggerated my example, but the point stands. Yes, Perry, it does. How can one be so confident and sure, well-practiced and diligent in one's approach to playing a passage to then simply mispitch it when it comes to performing? I don't feel nerves when performing. Okay, Perry, start doing your own podcasts. I'd love to hear that. Um, I 100% embrace the love and positivity of my job and my playing, but I seem to struggle immensely with consistent accuracy. How do you ensure you nail everything the way you hear it in your head? Perry, thank you so much for this. This is brilliant. Um, I get a lot of very nice feedback from people who are very grateful of the time that I'm taking to do these podcasts. And that's always wonderful to to hear. Um, But you challenge me, Perry. And one should always challenge and always question. So thank you very much. Right, let's see if we can break those things down a little bit. Um, So you took a new appreciation for the oxygen that fueled you and went to Carnegie Hall. Brilliant, good place to go. And I think there's a bit of a cheeky answer to this. Um, How do you get to Carnegie Hall? (laughs) You practice, don't you? That's the oldest saying. Um, how do you get out of Carnegie Hall? Stop practicing. Um, well, and, and there is a serious point to that, Perry. It's the process. What we're looking at is a process. Everything, as far as I can see in life, is about consistency. In this Amazon generation where you order your new teacher, you order your Bowsfield online and you expect 24-hour delivery and, um, you know, like I said before, your high register is immediately fixed and if you don't like it, you send it back. Um, And unfortunately, although some things can work like that, not all of them can. What I'm describing to you is the process by which I have become who and what I am as a trombone player. It's like changing your lifestyle. It's like changing your diet. There are no quick fixes. Um, And so this is a process that, it's a journey that you're gonna go on. It's it's something that you're gonna have in your head. Um, And I do have great sympathy for you. You're in the laboratory, you're trying to find out what, what works, what doesn't. We've all had exactly the same experience as you have where we think we found the magic cure and we, the first time we put it under pressure, it, it, it's not, it breaks. Um, so that experience you've had, I've had, we've all had, um, doesn't mean to say that what you're doing is wrong, it just means to say that the process is a little bit longer. I don't have the magic cure. You know what? Nobody does. I've seen quite a lot of people claim that they do, um, but then as time goes by, there are no quick fixes. For them, for for some things. Right. How can one be so confident and sure, well-practiced and diligent in one's approach to playing a passage and then simply to miss it and mispitch it when you start? There are quite a few issues there, Perry. The first one is mispitching. You say mispitching. That's something that I find very difficult to do because I have, I, I don't have perfect pitch or I have Italian perfect pitch it (laughs) works when it feels like it sorry 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 to the Italians if there are any Italians listening I apologize that was a very bad joke 
Daniele Morandini will no doubt have terrible revenge on me on Facebook for that. Um, I have part-time perfect pitch. Some days it seems to work, some days it simply doesn't. Um, if you are having problems hearing the note or in innately understanding the note that you're about to play, then you need to really train your, um, sign, your pitch recognition within you that you can hear something. So it's going to pianos, playing chords, singing the scale, singing things. It's basically about training the voice. That's another podcast all in itself. It doesn't matter how good your basic technique is, Actually, that's not quite true. If you have a really a, a watertight basic technique, you can hit anything, and even even if you don't, even if you're surprised by the sound that that comes out. But most of us need to really have an innate knowledge and understanding of the of the note we're about to play. So that's point one. That's a whole other podcast all in itself. How can you be sure that you have practiced enough so a passage? Hmm. What's enough? That comes down to your concentration, your thought process, making sure that your thought process is exactly the same every time you do it. If you have, there are two issues here. If you have a technical insecurity, um, it doesn't really matter what you've got in your head. You need to fix that problem. Sorry to be a bit Scandinavian about this, a bit direct, but if you practice it and you get it right, 100 times out of 100, 20 times out of 20, or even 10 out of 10, um, and you still put it all over the place in concerts, then I would suggest you do suffer from nerves, but not the kind of nerves that you can recognize. If, however, you miss it five times out of 10, when you practice, don't be surprised if you miss it in the concert. Sorry, that's really basic, simple. Truth. So how do you know whether you practice diligently enough? Let's say you take a passage from whatever spirit he is and you get it right. You nail it a hundred times, ten times. You don't miss it. Then you're unlikely to have a technical issue. So the reason why you're missing it in the concert is either that the conductor is doing it in a different tempo, you're not used to playing in a big space, um, or that you do have a, um, some kind of nerves demon digging away behind your subconscious. Subconscious, sorry. So that's that's those are the, the, the three issues. But practically speaking, if you've got a technical issue, fix it. That's what I say in my books. That's what I say in the podcasts. Put it quite simply. Um, it can't ever just work on imagination. I know a lot of teaching schools think that it is. You know, that's all you have to do. I personally would um, would love to run the 100 metres in under 10 seconds. <laughs> I used to try when I was a kid. Never worked. Um, I'd love to do that. And it doesn't matter how much I imagine that, it's not going to happen. Um, ever. Not even if a tiger is chasing me. So... The, the advice, this hearing things and being happy and, and really loving the air that comes in and really imagining what you want to happen is a long-term strategy towards improving you as a musician, as a trombone player. You, and it's engaging the fantasy in your head and we have to do that. We absolutely have to do that. But we have to approach improvement on all kinds of different levels. I've said before, diet, basic technique, amount of sleep... And the fantasy that you have in your head, they were in the wrong order, but I did it deliberately. So it's not just a question of thinking about what you have in your mind and expecting it to happen. Um, if your embouchure is not set correctly, don't expect the first note to come out properly. Um, that's, sorry, that's, like I say, it's a bit of a, um, a, a, a direct answer. But I think in these situations, a practical solution is much uh, simpler. And... I'd like to answer one other thing that you've questioned. How do you, how do you ensure you nail everything the way you hear it in your head? <laughs> when I find out, I'll let you know. <laughs> All we can possibly do is try and get as close as we can. I don't nail everything, full stop. And I don't nail everything when I do nail it, always the way I want to do it, in my head. 
And, um, but I am on the same journey you are on. I'm in, engaging in the same process. Um, yeah, I hope that kind of answers your question, Perry, to some extent, or makes you feel a little, little bit better about what you're doing. If it doesn't, please write again and make me work even harder. Thank you very much for your question. This is a question from somebody called Dane Magruder. Um, another interesting question, and it, without reading the whole question through, it's basically um, about my feelings on the importance or lack thereof of a daily routine. Um, in other words, what's my opinion on beginning one's day of practice with a set of fundamental exercises that are played every day? You've heard many people say different things about this and, you know, you haven't found a definitive answer for myself. Good use of words, Dane. You haven't found a definitive answer for yourself. So that means that my opinion might not be uh, relevant to you. You also say that others say you need to have a good warm-up, you know, otherwise... Where is it? Yeah, if I don't get my warm up, then I won't play well for the rest of the day. Um, and others say that we need to have a routine to check every day as to way of tracking our progress and skill level over time. Okay, lots of things there. First of all, warm up. Um, I know people who say uh, that if they don't get their 45 minute warm up in, they have no chance. Okay, that needs to go out the window right now. Uh, we need to spot immediately um, the point at which uh, warm-up becomes daily routine. If you play Brahms 1, if you play Berg 3 pieces, you, you know, or if you do an audition and they make you stand outside the door for half an hour, you can't have a bloody warm-up, can you? So, um, and I would suggest that if you need 45 minutes to get your engine going effectively in a warm-up, then you're doing something in your practice routine that is damaging your face. My warm-up lasts normally, obviously the different phases of it, but I can be warmed up and ready to go in a couple of minutes, I would say. A bit of mouthpiece, a few basic flexibilities, learn to release the air, get, remind myself of how I'm supposed to do it, and then, eh, in extreme cases, yeah, I'm probably ready to go. Um, that's what's called learning to be a professional musician and driving to work in traffic jams. <laughs> You know, so you get used to doing that kind of thing. But it's also very clear, very important to make a clear delineation in your head between what a warm-up is and what basic practi practice is. You know, a lot of people, I think, confuse. They like to do warm-ups. You know, it's like, okay, you're doing a master class. Could you do a warm-up session? No, I couldn't, no. Um, because your warm-up shouldn't take a bloody hour. And... Um, what you want me to do is to do uh, like basic routines with people where I play it and then 12 people play it back to me and there's such a noise in the room I have no idea what any of them's done so I don't know whether they understood what I said or what I played or heard what I did. So you get, get my drift. First of all, learn to get yourself warmed up and ready to go as soon as you can. At that point, you don't jump into playing Bolero or, or the Tomasi. You, you go into your basic routine but you clearly, you know, go on from... Uh, you know, the warm-up onto the daily routine. So there we go. I've said it. The daily routine. Hmm. Yes. Do we need one? Depends what stage you are in your, your, your career. I, I have a set of go-to studies, exercises, that I play... For the most part of my life, I've played every day from La Fosse book three, or now from my book. They're very similar. <clears throat> and um, I, yes, it was kind of like a 45-minute routine of scales and these exercises that I would do. I now don't, I am now not blessed with the time to work on them as much as I'd like because my practice routine usually ba is based on trying to have enough strength and to learn solo pieces that are coming up so I don't have the time that I used to um, but in formative years when you're a student it's, I, I think it's very important to have these go-to exercises so that 
you return to the exercise where you learnt a good slide technique, where you learnt what great legato was, where you learnt what perfect articulation was, where you worked on your low register, where you worked on your flexibility, and you go back to the same place every day. Now, I, I hear those who are saying, you know, repetitive strain injury, who knows, that horrible word, dystonia, you know, by doing the same things over and over and over and over again. Now, that, um, you know, misquoted Albert Einstein quote of, you know, what is it, only a fool repeats the same thing and expects a different result. So, just simply by repeating the same exercise could, well, first of all, it's not going to lead to development. Um, I want the same result from those exercises I wanted when I was 14 years old. Musical excellence is musical excellence. How I've got that over the years has changed. So the approach changes. The way you look at it, the result should stay the same. That's why we go back to these exercises. So I think probably the, the real take-home point from this is don't expect to do the same thing in the same way on the same exercises for the rest of your life to get to the same, the same result. It's not going to happen. It doesn't happen with any of us. And I think that's where players kind of have their midlife breakdown crisis in their playing between the age of 35 and 45 where they did what they always used to do or what their teacher told them to do which they thought had worked and all of a sudden it stops working well you know the basic technique is to a certain extent flexible and I can hear other teachers now saying, oh, you're confusing the young people. They need to have the same technique that they do. You, yeah, you mean they should do what you do? Huh? Okay. And it's like when you're 14, it was the, an old saying in, in England, you know, buy a Con 88H and a Bark 5G and play these exercises like this to do this. And it is true, you know, it, it's, it's, it's easier for young players um, if they really you know, have a clear outline of what they do and how they do it. But going back to things in other podcasts, at certain points, we have to move away from that once we've learned to operate the instrument and how to perfect what we are, what we are doing. Um, some people say that having the same set of exercises, it gives a mental block. Uh, that we give ourselves, and a lot of musicians tend to get in the mind, yeah, it gives us a mental block. Yeah, 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 come on, yeah, that's going back to the warm-up thing. It's not a warm-up thing. It's where you go back to my great friend and wonderful pedagogue, Rex Martin, says every day we get the instrument out like a craftsman and we sharpen our tools like a wood car woodcarver. Um, you know, he makes sure that his tools are really sharp and then he uses them. And he doesn't think about whether his tools are sharp, he just gets on with what he wants to do. Um, so, yes, I do believe in a daily routine, but it's very important that you have a tailor-made daily routine for you that has been set up for you with your teacher. My daily routine would probably break you right now, um, Dane. So, so, uh, so that, I think, is also another important point. A daily routine, yes, but it, it's very important that... Yeah, you know, like I've said, you know, I have a book out there, Joe. Leslie's got a book out there. Brandy Mia Slocar's got one. And, 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 you know, great. Buy them. Give me some money. Great. Happy. Never turn money down. But the how you use the information in that book and how you use those exercises is between you, largely you, 80% you and 20% advice from your from your teacher. Um, so, yeah, I hope that helps. That's, well, I don't know if it'll help, but that's my opinion on that subject anyway. Okay, so we have a question here from Jordan Harvey. Hi, Jordan. Um, yes, I do remember meeting you at the University of Wisconsin-Madison a few years back. I remember you very well. Hope you're doing well. Um, Jordan has um, some uh, interesting questions here. Um, for those of you working day jobs to pay the bills and gone for nearly 11, 12 hours a day, in some cases, how does one keep the spark and passion alive when having to put music on a distant back burner? Um, I admittedly find it difficult to balance work and the need to practice in order to one day be able to move more into the music industry. Okay, first, Jordan, I've never been in this situation. I'll give you the best answer I can. Um, 
I'm not going to, you know, sort of pretend I know exactly the situation you're in. I've been in a situation of not being able to practice because I've been working 11 hours a day, but um, <laughs> I've had the trombone in my hand sitting in an orchestra, usually watching violinists work. <laughs> Sometimes it does get that. Sometimes with the wrong set of repertoire, you can finish up playing three calls a day for a week and turn up out of practice the next week. Um, listen, I, I had a, a chat with um, a very a former student who's a close friend who's had to deal with um, failure. Not the same situation that you're in, but he uh, was winning three major auditions. Three. And he... Um, they didn't award the job to anyone. So three major, and I mean major, auditions. And I said, how, how did you carry on? What did you do? Um, how did you keep going psychologically? Did it not affect you really badly? How did you cope with it? And he said, it was the love of music that got me through. It was the fact that that's who I am and that's what I do. Um, and I thought that was an absolutely brilliant answer and I can, I can tell you from my point of view uh, Jordan professionally I've been extremely fortunate and I mean lucky I am genuinely lucky I know that I was given a lot of things as a kid that other people have had to work very hard for you know that, that things came very easily for me but beyond that in my career when I look at the luck that I've had it's been incredible however my personal life <laughs> has been another story. I've had a very colourful um, um, domestic situation. It's fantastic now. has been for over a decade, but it's not always been easy. So I've been through my difficult times personally. And what I can say to you is that the trombone was my refuge. When I close that door to practice everything else went the trombone was my friend who had always been there for me and that's how I viewed it so I think the important thing is that that 11 or 12 hours a day that you're working doing jobs to to pay the bills you remember why you're doing it you're doing it because you love music and it's what you want to do and when you do get the trombone in your hand to practice um that's your refuge. That's your safe place. That's where you go to be with this thing that you love, to do the thing that, that you want to do. And, you know, at the end of the day, we all love performing and we all love being paid to perform. But actually, I think the most important thing is about how I feel about my relationship with the trombone in my practice room. And... So focus on that. Focus on your love for what you do. And then your other question about how, you know, those of you who have limited practice time. What are the most important things to practice in a limited time? Um, <clears throat> depends what you mean by a limited time. I guess if you're working 11 or 12 hours a day, it really is a limited time, isn't it? Um, my philosophy on everything, whether you have a lot of time or whether you have a limited time is the same. And that is you should split your practice 50-50. So you take half of your practice time, who, said, who knows, 20 minutes, and you're going to work on real excellence. You're going to work on sharpening your tools, making your basic technique as good as you can, playing some scales, really focusing, really concentrating, making a beautiful sound, doing basic exercises, and really working on breathing and releasing the air and making it really totally free and feeling good about the air coming in and out of your body, particularly if you've been working 11 or 12 hours a day. Um, and then the other 20%, of the, the other 20 minutes, who knows, 30 minutes, whatever, is the time is spent doing what you love. Because if you just go into a room and work on basics and play scales, you're going to go bloody crazy. And, I, and, you know, and anyone would lose the will to, to play and become a musician under those circumstances. So pick some music that you like playing and just forget all your basics and forget and just think about the beautiful melody that you're playing and the communication and this great art that you're creating in your practice room. There's nothing wrong with creating something beautiful for yourself. Um, so so that's they would be the things that I would 
suggest help is very I don't know your situation exactly but that would be the tips that I would would give you based on my experience and um, you know uh, you also have another thing how one might get advice about how to getting the chance to study or work with you in some fashion um, well Jordan I've actually kind of stopped doing master classes now um, I did quite a lot of them and it's I'm not taking my ball home or, or being a prima donna it's, it's just that I have um, the responsibility for sometimes depending on the year sometimes 12 students in uh, Bern and also part responsibility for eight in uh, London so um, one has a limited amount of capacity I think you can probably tell from how I work that uh, it's not a day job it's not it, you know my my responsibility to, uh, to students I take is a very serious commitment and I carry them around with me in my thoughts the whole time trying to work out their issues for them you know so the next time I see them you know I've got a plan of action um, so so I don't really do master classes anymore and the class in Bern is massively oversubscribed however um, I am planning on doing something um, that I think a lot of people might find useful and it's going to be I'm going to do like a conducted hours practice or half an hour's practice where actually you put headphones on you practice a certain regime and I talk to you the whole time um, about what you should be thinking about what you should be working on how you approach how to breathe how to articulate what you should be thinking of um, so it's it's not like studying um, in, in in person but um, that should be coming out pretty soon I'll, I'm very excited about the idea of it so um, I hope I hope you, you 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 take a look at that and I hope you enjoyed it. Enjoy it. Jordan, look forward to seeing you again. Take it easy. Good luck with all of that. This is a question from Leif Norwegian was written. And at the end of his question it says, please don't try and say my name. Even Norwegians can't. <laughs> well, I've looked at it and thank you for saying that. I'm not gonna try. <laughs> And the question is, you have played under many famous conductors. How do you deal with the different approach they have and what has changed through the years? Um, well, nothing's really changed through the years. I've worked at different levels of orchestras and therefore different levels of conductors. Um, my philosophy has always been to look them in the eye and smile and always to um, even if I had you know a tacit movement or, or you know who knows 32 measures rest to watch them to look at them partly because I love what they do I love conductors I love watching their um, skill I love watching what they're trying to create but partly just to be engaged with them to show that I am in it with them um, anyone who knows me would would know that I was not um, being teacher's pet, <laughs> you know. But and and so you can do that in as many ways as you like. You look at them as your best friend. You look at them as your their biggest supporter, or you confront them on occasion. What I discovered very early on was particularly the the older predatory conductors, the tyrannical conductors. If they saw a saw weakness, they would go for it. And there's still a few like that now. And if you kind of eyeball them very nicely, very nicely, I don't mean like, don't confront, you know, you look at them and smile and you know, they talk to you and you make it clear to them that you want to do what they want. I, I that's my job. Whatever you say, I'm here to try and do that. As long as they stay, within uh, reason um, and it depends on the situation but yeah that's good that's kind of I always I always took the attitude that I wanted to do what a conductor wanted because you know the the lowest level of conductor is a more uh, advanced musician than probably the best trombone player in the world you know certainly intellectually they know more about the structure of music than we do 
even if we might know a bit more intuitively than they do, they really, they know what they're doing. Um, so I have the utmost respect for them. As long as that respect is reciprocated, as long as they were respectful to me, um, I think I should probably do another podcast um, um, called Trombone's Too Loud <laughs> about the <laughs> about the run-ins, the interaction that I've had with some conductors over the years. I'm quite happy to do that. Um, so, so that was always my... Uh, and uh, you know, and you say that sometimes conductors don't look at the trombones, but do they sometimes talk and tell you what they want? Oh boy, do they sometimes talk and tell you what they want? Um, yeah, they, well, they probably don't look at the trombones because they're frightened they're going to be too loud. You know, there's that stupid old saying, you know, don't don't look at the trombones, you'll only encourage them, which is kind of partly true. <laughs> but um, this really is another podcast, and I really am going to do it. Um, Yes, they do tell us what they want. Basically, they're not... Most conductors, they spend eight hours a day in a room with a piano from the age of three or a violin. And then they spend eight hours a day in a room with a bloody score. And then, because they're brilliant, they finish up in charge of a hundred people's lives. And they have no idea how to speak to them. And they don't know how to get what they want. In the majority of cases, in the majority, you know, in a lot of cases, the very, 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 very best ones are bloody magicians, and I am totally in awe of what they do. The very, very, very best ones they actually don't talk to you. They can show you exactly what they want, you know, just by the, the look on their face or their body movements or, or whatever. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm, I'm answering your question very briefly because I realize you've inspired me to do another podcast on this. Um, and on that one, I'm not going to try and say your surname either. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. If there are any issues that you found particularly interesting, don't forget to contact me and always go to uh, ianbowsfield.com for lots more interesting stuff.